We talked about starting pre uh, preparation for your case early on. We know that those that are prosecuting a contempt have to prove all of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, another area that family law attorneys are not used to having to establish beyond a reasonable doubt. So make sure you understand exactly what that burden is beyond a reasonable doubt. And then understand, is this something that is even helpful for my client, this being an actual contempt action? Many clients don't understand what the remedy or the relief is that a successful contempt actually gets you. If somebody isn't paying support, you're not getting the past due support paid with a successful contempt. We know the options are jail, um, a fine, community service, and potentially attorney's fees. So ask yourself and ask your client, is this what we really want to do before you even start down that path? If you are going to go down that path, you've got to understand your limitations on evidence, including not being able to call the CIT or the CIT's attorney as a witness in the case. Know in advance, before the arraignment stage, what evidence you need to prove all of your elements and how you're going to get that evidence actually admitted as opposed to waiting until it's too late. Um, because of issues like Sanchez and hearsay and not being able to call the CIT to authenticate certain documents, you need to know in advance, can you still meet your burden of proof, establish all the elements, and do that without calling the CIT or having other evidentiary concerns? Just to follow up on, uh, for a second on not calling the CIT, because uh, that, that's a little maybe a little foreign. You cannot call them as a witness. You cannot stand up and say in court, I would like to call the CIT as my next witness. If you did that in a criminal case, that would be, and these are criminal cases, prosecutorial misconduct. <clears throat> if you did it in front of a jury, you would get a mistrial. Because why? Because forcing the person to invoke their Fifth Amendment privilege is commenting on their privilege against self-incrimination. So you are not even allowed to stand up and say, yes, I'd like to call them as a witness, thereby forcing them to invoke that Fifth Amendment privilege. Very important. When you're pre-planning and thinking about how you're going to get your evidence in, think about what type of subpoenas you would need, whether the um, declaration for the custodian of records will be sufficient, and give yourself enough time. We've all subpoenaed financial institutions, and you think you're going to get records from five or six years ago, including all the copies of checks and deposits, uh, within 25 days. And the bank calls you and says, I need an extension. And you say, I'm not giving you an extension. And then 35 days later, they actually give you the records. You're not necessarily in control. So understand your timing as you go through this process. Okay, let's talk a little bit about pleading the contempt. So first of all, uh, use the Judicial Council form. It's going to solve a, a lot of problems. It's going to make it much more likely that you'll do it correctly, uh, although it doesn't guarantee it. And I've seen plenty of problems occur at that, at that pleading stage. So uh, a tip. I would present it in counts, just as you would uh, if you were a criminal prosecutor. And, and when, what I would do if you didn't do it in counts, I'd say please redraft it and replete it and put it in counts so that you would have a count, for instance, uh, if it's a failure to pay child support, it's one count per month. So you would have count one is January and count two is February and count three is March. If it was failing to drop the kid off, uh, on a timely basis, one count for each instance, so we can make it so it's perfectly clear and abundantly clear exactly what it is that you're saying happened. Um, the other the problem that I see, and these seem like really basic things, but I just saw them all the time, um, is not specifying the order that was violated <laughs> in the contempt pleading. So make sure that you say on such and such a date, the court ordered that Jimmy was going to be dropped off at such and such a location at such and such a time. 
make it make it clear what was the order that you're saying was violated. I would attach the, the order, attach the minute order, attach the order after the hearing. That might save it if you have a problem in the pleading. The judge might go and say, okay, well, you, I don't like the way you pled it, but the attached order fills in the, the blanks. And then obviously specify the date. I know this seems like basic stuff, but the date, the violation occurred on this date when, when, the, when Jimmy was supposed to be dropped off at five and he wasn't dropped off until six. It happened on, on this next date, same thing. So, so just make sure that you're very, very specific, just like you would be um, if you were a criminal prosecutor, if you could ever get a hold of uh, a criminal complaint, it's not that difficult to do. Just kind of look and see how, how basic, they're really basic, they're really nuts and bolts, but they're very specific in terms of dates and times and exactly what it is that, that is alleged to have happened. Um, and, and if you don't do that, we'll talk in a, in a little bit uh, about what may happen at the arraignment to your case or at some uh, other point um, to your case. Uh, Judge Goldberg, if you realize that you have a mistake in your initial pleading, what can you do about it? Well, uh, okay, so we're, we'll get to the, the arraignment in a little bit and the kinds of motions that can be made at the arraignment. So you, you can, and I, I, you may talk a little bit about this, make an oral motion. It's customary to do so in um, misdemeanor cases to dismiss. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in writing. But you may ask for a continuance, and the code does provide that if there's a defect in the pleadings, the court may grant a continuance for purposes of allowing you to, to address that matter and, and fill in that problem. So, so ask for it. You know, if, if there's a problem and you know you can, you can correct it, ask for the continuance. And another question I have is when you're preparing your pleading and making a decision as to which type of supporting evidence and documents to attach, is there anything that you would hold back or would you put as much attached to it as possible? Um, I don't think you need to overwhelm the court with too much detail and, you know, every last our family wizard communication. But, but the, 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 the key things, the, the order in particular, maybe if there's some key documents that you're going to rely on, like the text saying, uh, the our family wizard saying, I don't care what the judge said, I'm going to deliver Jimmy back whatever I want to, you know, that kind of juicy piece of evidence. But, but be a little bit selective uh, because the, you, know, you, you, you want to make it clear. One way of making your case clear is by making it simple. If you have a, an overwhelming amount of information, you may be conveying the idea that there, there's not a lot there. Another question for you. With the initial pleading, if you're asking for attorney's fees, would you recommend adding a Keach declaration or is it just premature to do that? I don't think you need to have the Keach Declaration as on the original pleadings, but, but should have one um, by the end of the trial. And try to ask the judge when he or she wants it during the pretrial phase or at the arraignment phase. I mean, quite frankly, the Keach Declaration, if, if, if the other side objects to it, probably isn't admissible uh, because it's hearsay. I mean, maybe they won't object. Judge probably wants to see it anyway, but if push comes to shove, it is hearsay. Well, moving on to the specifics of an arraignment. Before getting to the arraignment phase, the CITE will have been personally served with the pleading itself. That'll have a clear date of when that arraignment will be. Talk your client through what that process is going to be like. Show them Judge Goldberg's Chapter 8. Give that client some confidence that you know what you're doing <laughs> of what will happen in terms of pleading guilty or not guilty. Your client may also ask you, do I really have to go? Do I really have to show up and be there in person? And there is a particular penal code section 977, a procedure where the counsel for the CIT can be authorized to be present, only be present at the arraignment and not the party himself or herself. But best practice is have the potential, the CIT actually there and, and present. So the CIT understands what's at issue and what will happen next. Just a, a better practice.